So it's uh, Thursday again, and thus I have the pleasure to welcome you to this week's uh, Environmental uh, Ergonomics Physiology Symposia. Uh, I'm very pleased to co-host these uh, sessions uh, with um, Stephen Chang from Brock University and Chris Tyler from um, University of Roehampton. My name is Tadej de Bevets. I come from University of uh, Ljubljana. Uh, as the title states, today will be the first session dedicated exclusively to hypoxia physiology. And as you will see later, uh, it will mostly focus on uh, the effects of environmental hypoxia on uh, muscle modulation and metabolism and the effects of nitric oxide bioavailability on uh, high altitude adaptation and uh, exercise, exercise responses. Uh, before we go to today's session, I would just like to remind you about a few of our upcoming talks in this spring uh, summer season of the VEE. In particular, we will continue with a, a very interesting session on pre-cooling in the heat, which will feature Rob Duffield, Grant Landers, and Mohamed Ihsan. Uh, as you see the asterisks, the session will be held in the, it will be held in the Asian Australian um, friendly time timing, in particular 9.00 British Standard Time. Uh, then on the 25th of June, uh, we shuffled a bit the, the sessions, but now on the 25th, we will have a, an interesting uh, the symposia on cross adaptation and cross tolerance, in particular between uh, heat, hypoxia, and cold. And this will feature Becky Randell, uh, Oliver Gibson, Oli Gibson, and Alexandros uh, Sotiridis. Then we will uh, kick off the July sessions with another hypoxia and metabolism session, which will mostly focus on uh, carbohydrates oxidation during rest and exercise. And we will also have uh, three speakers there, John O'Hara, Lee Margiolis, and uh, Claire Berryman. Then I would particularly like to note that on the 9th of July, we will not hold a VEE session because on that week, the Physiological Society is organizing the future of physiology conference, which is also of high interest and interest to the to all environmental uh, ergonomic researchers or environmental exercise uh, researchers. So that on that uh, Thursday there will be no session, but we will finish it off uh, finish off this uh, spring or summer season with the 16th of July Thursday a session dedicated to the work uh, performed by the IOC committee on the uh, adaptation to adverse environmental or weather impacts uh, regarding the preparations for the Olympic Games in Tokyo. We know that the games have now been postponed and we hope that they will be held in 2021. And Doug, Yuri and Seb will discuss a bit on the work they pre performed within the <laughs> this committee and how to properly prepare now, especially important since we have a bit more time, uh, time to adapt. Uh, it is also important to know that we will re restart or re-kick our uh, virtual meetings in, uh, 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 in early September with the virtual uh, VEE conference, which is aimed particularly to graduate students and postdoctoral researchers uh, that they can present uh, some of their recent work that they weren't able to present due to the COVID pandemic situation and cancellation of the meetings, uh, uh, et cetera. So we'll, but we'll keep you informed uh, regarding that um, obviously soon. Uh, I would also like to note that we have uh, uh, obviously our uh, vir virtual environmental ergonomics uh, web page where you can find all of the past talks uh, that were presented in this series. For example, here's the, the um, cutout from uh, last week's session, which was a really interesting one where we discussed about cold 
uh, and exercise and swimming in the English Channel, etc. And uh, here on below, you will also find there are links uh, in a, uh, close to each of the speakers where you, uh, you can find uh, student handouts, which can be used uh, for teaching purposes by instructors or students who are um, undergoing or teaching environmental exercise uh, physiology, uh, physiology courses. Uh, again, we are advertising mostly all of our um, uh, sessions and symposia over the web page, as I mentioned before, ICEE2021.com. We also have a Twitter handle, again, at ICEE2021, where we try to post uh, news and stuff about that. As I mentioned before, this is the, uh, the normal timing of these sessions is uh, 1700 Central European time. But again, next week's session will be held a bit earlier to accommodate our uh, Australian and uh, Asian friends, in particular at 900 hours British uh, Standard Time. So if we go to today's session, we have three excellent speakers um, uh, that took their time to join us today. Uh, we will kick off with uh, a talk by Louise Deldic, uh, who is a professor at the University of Louvain in Belgium, and she will discuss about the uh, discuss uh, the effects of hypoxia on muscle mass regulation, in particular the uh, differential effects of acute uh, and uh, chronic exposures. The second speaker will be Simone Poricelli from University of Padova, uh, and he will uh, introduce us to the topic of nitric oxide and uh, its effects on uh, adaptational capacity at uh, terrestrial high altitude. And the last uh, speaker today will be uh, Letizia Rast <coughs> Rasica, uh, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary in Canada. And she will present some of her uh, very interesting recent work on the effects of uh, enhancing uh, nitric oxide bioavailability and subsequent adaptation and exercise tolerance uh, at high altitude. And not to be too long, I will hand over the baton to Louise. And Louise, I will ask uh, uh, um, uh, uh, unshare my screen and the floor is yours, uh, Louise. Here you go. So, do you see my screen? Yes, you can start. Okay, thanks. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for having told about this symposium dedicated to uh, hypoxia and physiology. Here I will focus on the regulation of muscle mass and particularly on the opposite effect that acute and chronic hypoxia exposure can have on this muscle mass. But uh, first of all, for this, we need to um, understand how muscle mass is regulated and the main regulator of muscle mass that what we call the net protein balance. The net protein balance can be defined as the difference between protein synthesis and protein degradation. When protein synthesis exceeds protein degradation on the long term, the net protein balance is positive and that can be translated into muscle hypertrophy. On the contrary, when uh, protein degradation exceeds muscle protein synthesis, the net protein balance is negative and on the long term, this can translate to muscle atrophy. So you have to understand that during the day, we have some variation in muscle protein synthesis here above and muscle protein breakdown here. So that after each meal, if it contains a source of uh, protein or amino acids, we'll have some fat gains because muscle protein synthesis exceeds muscle protein breakdown, while after a few hours, uh, we have fasted losses that can be translated to fat gains again after a meal and so on and so on. So during the day, we will go from fat gains to fasted losses. 
And we can optimize these fat gains by doing some resistance exercise during the days. We can see that the fat gains in that case are greater than the fasted losses. And we, uh, in that case, optimize the uh, gain in muscle protein synthesis. So there is kind of variation throughout the day and we can optimize the gains through combining sources of proteins and resistance exercise. At the molecular level, and I won't go too deep into those molecular uh, things, but it's important to understand the rest of my talk. You have to understand that fiber size is regulated thus by protein degradation and some molecular regulation of protein synthesis. Here depicted on the, the figure, you have the uh, FOXO pathway with the regulation of atrogen and MRF1, which are two uh, ubiquitin ligases that regulate the proteasome. The proteasome is one of the uh, proteolysis system that is really important in skeletal muscle to regulate protein degradation. On the other hand, you have uh, the regulation of the uh, first part of protein synthesis that is called transcription, that is mainly regulated by the calcineurin NFAT pathway. So we have a transcriptional regulation, but we also have a translational regulation of protein synthesis that occurs at the level of the ribosome. And the main pathway that regulates the ribosome, that is the mTOR pathway. So please uh, remind this uh, name, the mTOR pathway. I'll use it uh, a bit later in my presentation, but it's an important uh, signaling pathway uh, regulating protein synthesis and fiber size. On the other hand, in addition to this protein balance, we have uh, satellite cells and satellite cells are located under the basal lamina of the skeletal muscle fiber. And the satellite cell can integrate, uh, can fuse with the existing myotube to uh, render this myotube bigger. So it can contribute to fiber hypertrophy. And the inclusion, the fusion of those satellite cells to the myotubes are regulated by um, uh, a really orchestrated um, number of uh, factors. To know if a satellite cell is present or not, we can uh, detect PAX7, which is a marker of the presence of satellite cells. But then there is uh, a really orchestrated uh, activation of those satellite cells that will uh, proliferate and that will differentiate into really uh, myoblast and then myocytes to form myotubes. And amongst the factors that regulate this uh, process of uh, proliferation, differentiation, and fusion of the satellite cells into the myotubes are the myogenic regulatory factors. Amongst them, we have myoD, myogenin, and also MLF4 and MIF5. And at the end of the differentiation process, for sure, we also have the expression of the myosin heavy chain. So it's really a well orchestrated process from the activation to the proliferation, differentiation, and fusion of those satellite cells to the existing myotubes. So let's come back to the core of this presentation, that is the regulation of skeletal muscle mass by hypoxia. And as mentioned in the title, this regulation occurs in opposite way, whether it's chronic hypoxia or acute hypoxia. What do we observe after chronic hypoxia? And what's chronic hypoxia? That's, for example, um, the situation that is uh, lift by uh, hikers, that is lift by athletes when doing training camps at altitude or in pathological situation such as in COPD and uh, during anemia, meaning that the transport of oxygen is lower in that situation. And chronic hypoxia is thus known to lead, that is an observation everybody has already made, is that chronic hypoxia will lead to a reduction of skeletal muscle mass. But probably you're also aware that some athletes use 
uh, hypoxia, they train in hypoxic condition to favor the uh, accretion of muscle mass. So when we have a control moderate hypoxia that is coupled with uh, muscle contraction, we can expect uh, optimization of uh, the gain in muscle mass that is usually observed after resistance exercise. So combining both stimuli can lead to an enhanced muscle mass. How can we explain this difference, this opposite regulation of acute and chronic hypoxia? That will be uh, the end of my talk. But we have to understand that there are different uh, hypoxic stimulus that can be uh, created. We uh, speak about hypobaric hypoxia or normobaric hypoxia, depending how hypoxia that is defined by a decreased partial oxygen pressure is obtained. There are two main ways to obtain this reduction in partial oxygen pressure. That is through a reduction of the atmospheric pressure. That is what we um, live uh, when we go up to the mountains or that we can create, that we can mimic in a hypobaric chamber. So by decreasing the atmospheric pressure, keeping the percentage O2 constant, we can uh, create what we call hypobaric hypoxia. The most famous way and the most used way to create hypoxia by athletes, that is the normobaric hypoxia, just by decreasing the percentage of oxygen in the air. So by filtering the air or by adding some more nitrogen in the air, we don't change anything to the atmospheric pressure, but we will decrease the percentage of O2 contained in the air, leading to exactly the same situation as hypobaric hypoxia is a decrease in PiO2. So that is basically the difference between hypobaric and normobaric hypoxia. So let's be, begin with chronic hypoxia. What does, um, uh, how is muscle mass reduced by this chronic hypoxia? You can see here on this picture when I speak about the reduction in muscle mass or muscle fiber, this is a drastic de uh, decrease. When exposing here rats at altitude of 7,600 meters, so that's a severe, a really severe hypoxic stimulus. But you can see that after two weeks, only two weeks, we have a reduction of about half of the muscle uh, fiber section. So that's really uh, a drastic reduction in muscle fiber area. How can uh, hypoxia lead to this drastic reduction in the area? Um, the authors of this study have measured protein degradation and protein synthesis, and they have noticed that both protein degradation and protein synthesis are increased um, during those uh, 14 days exposure. But if you look a little bit closer to this protein degradation, protein synthesis, you see that both are increased for sure, meaning that protein turnover is increased. But when you look uh, closer, closer to those um, numbers, you can see that the fold increase is much more important for protein degradation here in white than for protein synthesis in black. So, Remember the balance that's the difference between protein synthesis and protein degradation is in defavor of muscle mass, meaning that on the long term and here only 14 days uh, exposure to hypoxia, we have a negative protein balance that will lead, we have seen it in the uh, previous slide, to a drastic reduction in muscle fiber. Another example here, and to understand the importance of nutrition in that phenomenon, is another study in rats using hypobaric hypoxia as well, a little bit less severe, 6,300 meters. Three groups control hypoxic and per fat. That is important because they, the authors wanted to know what's the contribution of nutrition to this loss of muscle mass. So those mice, those rats, sorry, were 
compare Fed to the hypoxy group. The hypoxy group uh, aids less than the control group. That's a phenomenon that is observed in hypoxia. And they just wanted to compare the uh, effect of this uh, reduction in nutrition on muscle mass compared to the combination of this loss of nutrition and the exposure to hypoxia. And what you can see here is that the total body weight was decreased in those rats, the uh, soleus weight as well, protein content expressed in milligram per muscle, and the uh, uh, fiber cross-sectional area, both in type 1 and type 2 fibers. And we ha uh, for the per-fed group, we see that the uh, uh, numbers here are, the data are in between the two groups, so control and hypoxic group, meaning that nutrition, the um, poorest quality of nutrition and the lower amount of calories will contribute, but only partially contribute to this loss of muscle mass. So for sure there is a contribution of nutrition, but there is a contribution as well of the hypoxic stimulus itself. And this has, be, has been confirmed at molecular level. They have um, looked at the degradation pathway and at the protein synthesis pathway. They didn't find anything um, for the degradation pathway, but for the mTOR pathway. And remember, that's an important pathway for the regulation of protein synthesis. They could see that uh, for the black bars here, which represent the hypoxic group for all markers, components of the mTOR pathway, we have a decrease in the activation of those markers. While in the perfect group, the gray group here, we don't have this decrease in the activation of the mTOR pathway. So meaning that the hypoxic group, that hypoxia itself, decreased the uh, regulation of the mTOR pathway and it let us think that protein synthesis could be decreased as well in this group only. So for sure hypoxia itself is a strong stimulus that decreased the activation of the mTOR pathway and protein synthesis. And just one slide confirming that is present, the same phenomenon is present in COPD patients, so in pathological states as well. And that's uh, a very nice study because they could compare non-hypoxemic and hypoxemic past patients. So the two groups were COPD patients, but one group, the non-hypoxemic, had a normal blood oxygenation, while the hypoxemic uh, group had a reduction in uh, the blood oxygenation, so uh, what we call a hypoxemia. And what we can see is that the group um, undergoing hypoxemia had a reduced uh, phosphorylation state of different markers of the mTOR pathway. So exactly as what they observed in rats, this is confirmed in COPD patient, is that uh, blood oxygenation, hypoxemia, hy is really important in the activation of protein marker inside skeletal muscle. So that's an important finding is that this blood oxygenation at the end is uh, really important as a regulator of muscle mass. Kind of um, reduction of muscle mass can also occur uh, during uh, high altitude expedition or during training camps. Uh, this is mainly due to, we saw it uh, in uh, rats, in, uh, due to loss of appetite and especially proteins, because we know that proteins are uh, main regulators of skeletal uh, muscle mass, but also due to sleep dis disturbances and the uh, hormonal regulation that are consequences of these sleep disturbances, but also due to a natural decreased physical activity and decreased physical intensity. And important to note is that the higher and the longer, so the higher the dose, the higher the hypoxic dose, the more tricky it is to maintain its muscle mass. And this has been measured, just one uh, slide to show you that this has been measured in uh, human 
uh, during a 40 day simulated ascent to 5,300 meters. So 5,300 meters, that's not nothing. That's quite a severe simulation of hypoxia. You can see here the reduction in the tight mass and the reduction in the upper arm mass that is quite important, uh, you can see here. So for sure, chronic hypoxia can have drastic uh, effects, drastic uh, reduction in skeletal muscle mass, both in rodent as well as in human. What about uh, repeated hypoxia plus uh, exercise? Once again, when well um, controlled and when moderate, we can expect an increase in muscle mass. That's what here uh, athletes expect to, to create. And one of uh, the strategy that can be used is what we call the blood flow restriction. So thanks to a cuff, we uh, come uh, and block um, partially the circulation into the muscle. That's a simulation of hypoxia. This remains a local hypoxia below the cuff only. Um, I say it's a simulation of hypoxia because at the end, it also induces changes in hormonal secretion. Uh, you also have a different pressure on skeletal muscles. So it's not directly comparable with uh, the other strategy I will show you uh, later. What can we expect with this uh, blood flow restriction? You can see here, uh, compared to control conditions, so the control conditions were exactly the same as blood flow restriction concerning the training intensity, duration of session, etc., etc. That was exactly the same between uh, blood flow restriction and control. Um, so the only difference was the use of a cuff for the BFR condition. Um, the uh, training lasted for 20 days and they measured the uh, cross-sectional area of type 1 and type 2 fibers uh, during the training, so after eight days, three days, and 10 days after the training. The 10 days after training just lacks in the control condition, but we can draw conclusion without any problem. You can directly see that both for type 1 and type 2 fiber, we have an increase in muscle fibers uh, cross-sectional area that is less pronounced in the control condition. And this is partially due to uh, a higher presence, a higher contribution of the satellite cells. You can see here the PAC7 positive cells number uh, per uh, cell, per muscle fiber, that is higher uh, during and after training in blood flow restriction condition, but no, uh, not uh, in control condition. So just resistance exercise without blood flow restriction. And this is true for type one and for type two fibers. And at the end, what's really important for the, uh, for the athletes, that is performance. And you hear the isometric muscle voluntary contraction that is higher post training at five and 12 days in blood flow restriction, but not in control. So the stimulus seems to be quite uh, important with blood flow restriction resulting in a higher performance that is not seen in the normal resistant training conditions. Um, another strategy that can be used is to uh, train in a, a hypoxic chamber or just to breathe uh, hypoxic air thanks to a generator. You can't see uh, on the figure here, but it will filter the, the the quantity of oxygen that this man is uh, inspiring, so uh, leading to uh, a reduction in percentage O2 that this man is uh, breathing. What can we expect with this kind of training? But normal resistance exercise is known here, that's the normoxic um, resistance exercise condition. Uh, we can expect an increase in muscle mass. We can see here, we, in that condition, the subject increased by three, four percent, but in hypoxia combined with exercise, we can expect a higher, um, a higher increase. There is no difference in muscle mass just by exposing the athletes to hypoxia. So that's the group uh, hypoxic exposure without any resistance training. So for sure, once again, what's important for the athletes is the uh, performance that was measured here in the, in the arm. 
And what the authors could observe is that as soon as three weeks after the beginning of the uh, resistance uh, training sessions, there was a higher increase in the uh, hypoxic uh, resistance exercise group compared with the normoxic resistance exercise group that was higher six weeks after the beginning of the training. The question is for sure, what are the mechanisms? What are the mechanisms that can explain this higher uh, gain in muscle mass and the higher performance when doing resistance exercise in hypoxia compared to uh, normoxia? And for this, um, and I will uh, end my talk with showing you the results of um, a study we performed in the lab, looking at the effect of one leg resistance exercise. So that was a leg extension exercise, one leg exercising, the other one not exercising, um, allowing us to have a control leg and an exercised leg. We uh, standardized the nutrition the day before and the meal before the uh, resistance exercise session. We gave some um, labeled um, uh, deuterium and some labeled methionine uh, to uh, be able to measure protein synthesis and protein breakdown. We took also some blood samples to, um, to determine this protein synthesis and protein breakdown. So the recovery period was in uh, normoxia, while the exercise uh, session occurred whether in normoxia, whether at 3,500 meters or uh, an inspired O2 fraction of 13.5%. Uh, we also measured the tissue, uh, tissue oxygenation index as well as the blood oxygenation. For sure, being at 3,500 meters had an impact on uh, the SpO2, the blood oxygenation. You can see here throughout the series, uh, the blood oxygenation was lower in the hypoxic group compared with the normoxic group in, uh, in white. Despite this difference in blood oxygenation, we didn't see any difference in the tissue oxygenation index between normoxia and hypoxia. The only difference we saw was the effect of exercise in general, which is uh, well known in the literature, that is a decrease of the tissue oxygenation index due to resistance exercise, but no difference between normoxia and hypoxia. Despite this, despite this difference in tissue oxygenation index between normoxia and hypoxia, we saw a difference in protein synthesis that you can see here on the left side of the slide. Uh, in normoxia, we saw the normal increase we usually see after resistance exercise in protein synthesis, but um, surprisingly, we observed no increase in the hypoxic group. So going com completely oppositely to what we uh, hypothesized. This is a higher protein synthesis in the hypoxic condition. So there was kind of blunting of the positive effect of resistance exercise by hypoxia with no difference in protein degradation. Once again, uh, this, uh, the difference between protein degradation and protein synthesis will give you the net protein balance. And this is in the favor for the hypoxic group because you see no difference in protein synthesis, no difference in protein degradation, meaning no difference in protein balance. While for the normoxic group, we had a positive net protein balance after resistance exercise because uh, protein synthesis was higher with no difference in protein degradation. So at the end, we have a positive net protein balance that was blunted by hypoxia. A bit weird, but I'll come back later uh, on this. So we also did some microarray analysis comparing gene expression of series of gene between hypoxia and normoxia, both at rest and exercise. And we could see that the, in the exercise condition that genes involved in the regulation of myoblast differentiation, myoblast fusion, and muscle contraction machinery uh, were higher expressed, 
where the expression were increased in hypoxia compared to normoxia. And uh, remember this uh, myoblast differentiation, myoblast fusion. Let's think that satellite cells could be involved in the um, a better remodeling of skeletal muscle after resistance exercise in hypoxia. And indeed, we confirmed by what we call RT-QPCR, uh, so that's a specific technique to uh, quantify the gene expression. And here we measure the gene expression of myoD, myogenin, and MRF4, three of the myogenic regulatory factor. In black, you have the normoxic condition. In gray, you have the hypoxic condition. And you can clearly see that the global expression of those genes is higher in hypoxia than in normoxia. So we came to the conclusion that despite uh, no change in protein balance could be observed, myoblast differentiation and fusion, as well as the contraction machinery, seem favorably regulated by acute hypoxic resistance exercise and could potentially contribute to the higher gain in muscle mass after hypoxic versus normoxic resistance training. For sure, now the next step is to confirm those results observed after one acute single session uh, after a whole resistant training protocol. So what, that's what we are doing now, looking at those mechanisms after a long-term training uh, period. And so I'd like to conclude here, and I hope you learn a little bit more about the mechanism that could explain why chronic and acute hypoxia can have opposite uh, effects on this muscle mass. So with this, I would also like to thank the collaborators I have in the exercise physiology laboratory in the uh, uh, at the University of Louvain. And I hope I was not too long, I don't have the time, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Louise, for this ex exhaustive and uh, 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 data intense presentation. I mean, lots of, lots of very nice data. Uh, there's a, a question by Mark Hudson, which is quite a bit complicated. I'll leave it to you to answer it later. I'll just keep it simple now. And I will ask you more of an applied side in particular. Do you think that uh, weight, resistance training in hypoxia, like in systemic hypoxia, you know, in general, like in a normal baric chamber or hyperbaric chamber, is something that should be looked into by uh, well-trained or elite athletes to use in their training or not based on your expertise in the area? Depending on what they are looking for, but if they are looking for uh, an increase in muscle mass, I'm not sure that's uh, a good option at the end because all what we are measuring is not what some others could find um, in, in the, what we can find in the literature, that's an increase in muscle mass, but we have in, in the lab, very um, great results concerning explosivity. So at the end, mm -hmm. I think that um, at least looking at an increase in explosivity, so for sprint uh, uh, performance, for example, that could be interesting to um, balance normoxic and hypoxic uh, session uh, just to uh, fine tune their, their, their explosivity. But it could just be a few percent more for sure. So this is just for elite athletes, not for uh, moderate athletes, they won't gain anything. But uh, I, I think it, based on what we observe in the lab, there is more promising data on explosivity than really on muscle mass, to be honest. Okay, so more into muscle function than essentially in hypertrophy. Yeah, it's more about the neurological adaptation, okay. I think, than really the, the cross-sectional area of the fiber. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Louise. Again, in the interest of time, now we'll move on. And I'll leave you to answer to Mark uh, in the Q&A uh, sure. uh, feature. And now I would like to invite uh, Simone uh, to share uh, his screen with us and introduce us to the exciting field of nitric oxide and altitude. Um, OK, can you see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. OK. 
So, uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. I would like, obviously, to thank Chris, Stephen, and Tade for the invitation. It is a pleasure to participate in this interesting uh, symposium and uh, share the virtual stage uh, with uh, Professor uh, Louise and my former PhD student, uh, Letizia. The aim of my presentation will be to give an update summary about the relationship between nitric oxide and exposure to hypobaric hypoxia. Before going um, into the discussion of my topic, let me introduce my uh, university where I'm working now. Uh, the University of Pavia is one of the world's uh, oldest academic institution and uh, its foundation uh, exist about as early as the 9th century. It is located in a small town close to Milan in the northern region of Italy and was the place where an impressive number of uh, uh, famous alumni studies. Among the others, there was Cristoforo Colombo, the explorer, and uh, uh, Camillo Golgi, an Italian biologist uh, known for his work on the ner central nervous system. The department where I'm working is known uh, as molecular medicine and uh, it's uh, aimed to build a strong bridge between basic research sciences like physiology, biochemistry and immunology and patient-based uh, uh, field like human genetics, uh, biochemistry, pathology and so on. And uh, we work closely with the students uh, of biology, medicine and obviously also sports science. This is the outline of my uh, presentation. So I will give you some historical background of the importance of uh, uh, being exposed to high altitude, the effects of acute and chronic uh, exposure uh, to hypoxia on human physiology, even if uh, some data have been already done by, or already exposed by uh, Luis. Then I will focus on the main topic, so the relationship between nitric oxide metabolism and the high altitude exposure. And I will try to draw some summary and conclusion at the end. So uh, as we know, humans uh, has uh, always desired to conquer the world's uh, higher peak of the world. And, uh, but obviously reaching the summit of Mount Everest has been possible only thanks to many uh, research expedition occurred throughout the time, which gave, uh, which gave us the possibility to understand the uh, effects of low barometric pressure on a uh, human body. In this uh, slide, uh, you can see a photo of Mesnen and Abler during the first successful expedition on the summit of Mount Everest without oxygen supply in 1978. Uh, the other pictures were taken during experiment at high altitude. And uh, on the left, uh, the first research expedition was led by Aldane in 1911 to Pikes Peak in Colorado. And here in the picture, we can see the Professor Douglas uh, wearing a Douglas bag, so a bag uh, for the collection of expelled gas and the de determination of uh, oxygen consumption during climbing. On uh, the right, uh, the photo showing Dr. Tu collecting expelled air from uh, a member of the expedition to evaluate the pulmonary adaptation to hypobaric hypoxia. And, uh, uh, also in Italy, there were several research groups uh, who were interested in high altitude adaptation. And in the late 90s, several scientific campaigns were organized to understand the physiological effects of uh, hypoxia. In the lower center of the slide, you can see our former professor, Professor Ceretelli, during an expedition on the Mount Everest. Thanks to uh, these uh, and other experiments, today we know that there is a reduction of barometric pressure with increasing altitude and as a consequence, partial pressure of oxygen in the spare air is reduced. This means that in the oxygen cascade from air to mitochondria, there is a reduction of the pressure gradient over which the diffusion of oxygen can take place and uh, uh, the ability of peripheral tissue of producing energy and ATP obviously becomes uh, impaired. 
this is a classic figure uh, from the review of Professor Hoppeler and colleagues uh, reporting uh, the uh, values of uh, a partial pressure of oxygen at different level, so in normoxia and hypoxia. Uh, and along the oxygen uh, cascade from the lungs to the muscle. And we can see that to cope with these uh, uh, changes, uh, several physiological modifications obviously take place, uh, all, um, both immediately after the exposure to hypoxia, as well as during prolonged permanence at uh, high altitude. This means that uh, a rapid ascent to high altitude is likely to result in death whereas a slow ascent can be obviously successful when accompanied by these adaptations. And uh, these adaptations are aimed to compensate for the lack of oxygen reaching the peripheral tissues. Uh, so for example, a person taken directly from sea level to the summit of Mount Everest would fall unconsciousness or maybe also die within minutes, but uh, if the summit uh, is reached without uh, supplement oxygen uh, during several days, the expedition can be uh, successful. Uh, this figure shows the importance of uh, oxygen and oxygen diffusion at peripheral level. And uh, as uh, we can see, this uh, relationship between oxygen delivery and uh, uh, oxygen consumption is nonlinear. This means that the initial reduction in the amount of uh, uh, diffusion of oxygen are compensated by a series of adaptive mechanisms like redistribution of blood flow, increased oxygen extraction, and microvascular recruitment. But if the delivery is reduced further, a critical point is reached below which tissue extraction and other mechanisms cannot increase further, leading to a fall in consumption and to an impairment of function of peripheral uh, tissues. Uh, among the uh, um, numbers of macro and micro circulatory mechanisms that uh, are activated to prevent the onset of uh, uh, peripheral hypoxia, we will see that uh, some of them involves uh, the present and the activation of uh, nitric oxide. This is another classic figure that summarizes the compensatory, some of the compensatory mechanisms activated in response to the baric hypoxia. They involve respiratory, cardiovascular, and peripheral tissues, and uh, the physiological uh, responses to this hypobaric hypoxia are obviously diverse and numerous and changes across hours, days, and weeks. Moreover, the uh, magnitude of uh, this uh, adaptation is significantly different between individuals and has a strong relationship with the genetic background of the subjects. One of the most important effects of going to hypoxia is a reduction of exercise capacity, which is classically represented by a reduction of maximal oxygen consumption. And on the left, we can see a representation of the decrease of maximal oxygen consumption as a function of altitude, expressed in percentage of sea level values, summarizing some data reported in literature. The symbols represent average data points from different papers. Open symbols are acute hypoxia and uh, um, closed symbols are uh, for chronic uh, hypoxia. And uh, as we can see, the uh, data of uh, maximal oxygen consumption in subject exposed to chronic hypoxia are usually slightly higher than those obtained in subject with uh, um, exposed to acute hypoxia, suggesting that the mechanisms are at least in part uh, able to compensate the uh, impairment due to low level of uh, hypoxia. And uh, on the right, uh, we can see some of the physiological adaptation occurring and which try to compensate uh, in order to keep high the maximal oxygen consumption. This is a classic, uh, uh, another classic figure uh, published by our professor, Professor Serretelli, and it is interesting because uh, all these adaptations that are activated to cope 
with the, the reduced amount of oxygen cannot guarantee a complete recovery of the physiological function and the oxy maximal oxygen consumption values, which usually um, results lower than those observed at sea level, even if the subject are exposed at high altitude to 100% of inspired oxygen. This means that there is something, maybe something related to muscle mass or something related to muscle oxidative metabolism that remains impaired. So if uh, we move from the physiological adaptation to the molecular response to hypoxia, many of the uh, physiological changes reported are associated with the activation of specific molecular pathways. And these specific molecular pathways uh, involves the stabilization of the hypoxia-inducible factor. In particular, the hypoxia-inducible factor one, which is one of the central regulators of the cellular response to hypoxia and cellular metabolism. This uh, transcriptin factor is uh, usually an heterodimer um, constituted by, uh, composed by two subunits. These subunits are uh, activated and both expressed in normoxic conditions, so that one of the subunits is usually degraded by hydroxylases called PHD, that leads to ubiquination of this factor. In condition of hypoxia, the PhD activity is inhibited, so preventing the uh, HIF degradation and increasing its level. So the, this factor is able to translocate in the nuclear and activate binding to hypoxia response element some gene expression that may be the basis for the adaptation to hypoxia. These are some of uh, the potential organs involved in high altitude adaptation along with selected pathway of IF genes and target genes that may be relevant for physiological adaptation. This data, most of these data are usually obtained from mice, but some of the results have been also obtained in humans. The question is, which is the role of nitric oxide in this physiological adaptation? Nitric oxide, before going to this topic, uh, nitric oxide is a gaseous signaling molecule with several physiological functions in human body. It is classically linked to um, the vascular signaling, but we know that it is relevant also in um, all other organs, including neural signaling, cell proliferation, host defense, uh, and so on. It was discovered in the early 80s by three excellent scientists who were awarded by a Nobel Prize. Its production is linked to two main pathways. One pathway is uh, uh, related to the oxidation of a semi-essential amino acid, the L-arginine, by reaction catalyzed by enzyme, nitric oxide enzyme. This reaction is related to the oxygen, who work, which works as co-substrate, and as soon as it is uh, produced, nitric oxide can exert its function locally or is usually converted to nitrite and nitrate. An alternative pathway for nitric oxide generation has been also recently discovered and involves the possibility of nitrate and nitrite reduction to nitric oxide, which is the right part of the figure. Notably, this new pathway is oxygen independent and is, has been considerably enhanced in hypoxic conditions. So it is viewed as an important backup system for uh, maintaining and enhancing the nitric oxide production in hypoxic condition. And uh, it is, several studies have been demonstrated recently that uh, the uh, production of, or the enhancement of this pathway can be obtained by ingestion of uh, food rich in nitrate. Is there a, a relationship between uh, the hypoxia inducible factor and nitric oxide? 
As previously reported, the hypoxia-inducible factor protein in normoxia is normally produced rapidly degraded, panel A of this uh, figure. But in the presence of hypoxia, uh, hypoxia hypoxia-inducible factor accumulates and translocates to the nucleus, uh, panel B. In CND, we can see that when there is the presence of nitric oxide, even if there is oxygen, so even in normoxic condition, but particularly more in hypoxic condition, the presence of nitric oxide can result in hypoxic inducible factor stabilization by two main mechanisms. One, which is in panel C, is a direct interaction between nitric oxide and the factor which stabilizes and permits to the uh, transduction factor to go to the nucleus. The other one is a nitrosylation of an enzyme, the von Hippel-Linda, which usually degrades the hypoxia-inducible factor. So keeping higher the amount of this factor and uh, permitting the translocation in the nucleus. But now, are there some evidences of the importance of nitric oxide because we have seen that there is a link at molecular level, but the question is, is there any evidences? The first evidences comes from comparative physiology and the animal world. We know that among the vertebrates, there are some uh, that are able to tolerate long periods of oxygen deprivation. Among the others, the red ear slider turtles and the crucian calves are the most extreme and can survive for even months of total lack of oxygen during winter. And it, is, it has been demonstrated that uh, a key to hypoxia survival in these animals is related to a higher production of nitric oxide, as represented in this slide by the relationship between the affinity of hemoglobin and myoglobin to oxygen and the activity of an enzyme um, involved in the production of nitric oxide. Are there evidences in humans? The most important comes obviously from population that are physio physiologically adapted to survive at high altitude from generation. This population, like Tibetans, are characterized by specific physiological responses to hypoxia that are highly related to elevated nitric oxide bioviability. For example, we can see in the figure that there is an increased lung diffusion capacity, there is an increase for arm blood flow, there is an increased capillary density and a reduction of mitochondrial volume density, which means a reduction of oxygen consumption. And all these uh, adaptation are related to an elevated and amount of nitric oxide, which are present, which is present also in other population genetically adapt to this condition. So, the, uh, this is one of the uh, most important work on this topic, uh, where blood markers of uh, uh, nitric, nitric oxide by viability were shown to be systemically elevated more than tenfold uh, compared to uh, lowlanders. And uh, uh, although it was uh, initially uh, hypothesized that the primary effect of this increase in nitric oxide was related to an increase of pulmonary function, we now know that uh, this nitric oxide role is more than uh, at pulmonary level. And this is uh, also um, highlighted by this slide in where we can see the comparison of uh, forearm blood flow and oxygen delivery in these uh, subjects, so Tibetans, compared to lowlanders. And we can see that the higher amount of these uh, uh, metabolite, nitric oxide metabolite, metabolites are related to increase of the amount of blood and oxygen that can be bring that can be brought to the uh, peripheral tissues. Is it possible to see something also in uh, lowlanders? There are observation that uh, shows that uh, uh, there is a change in nitric oxide bioavailability also in lowlanders when lowlanders are exposed to uh, altitude and hypobaric hypoxia. Uh, in this study, researchers 
uh, investigated a potential change in nitric oxide during uh, an expedition to high altitude. They recruited a group of Caucasians and they uh, monitored during the tracking period the amount of uh, nitric oxide metabolites. And we can see that there were a, a change, uh, there were changes in the uh, concentration of these metabolites. Some researchers uh, raised some uh, um, concerns about this uh, data because the subjects were moving across altitude and so it is not really clear, it was not really clear if the effect was related to exercise or altitude. In order to um, reply to this uh, question, we organized, we conducted a study aimed to evaluate changes in nitric oxide bioviability bio at different altitudes. We recruited two groups of subjects and organized uh, two expeditions, one on Mont Cevedale at 3,200 meters and one on Mont Rosa at 4,500 meters. In this slide, you can see the schematic representation of the time course of the expedition. All data were collected only when subject reached the summit of the expedition. And as you can see, these graphs represent the value at sea level and during uh, the um, altitude period in the subject for nitric oxide metabolites, so nitrite and nitrate, and you can see that altitude induce a significant increase of nitric oxide metabolites. Interestingly, from our point of view, was that uh, uh, even if bo al both altitude induce an increase of nitric oxide metabolites, there was a different time course uh, which a uh, rapid increase on the, slow, on the lower altitude and a slower increase on the day five on the higher altitude, suggesting that also the amount of uh, altitude, the amount of oxygen uh, of epoxic uh, exposure seems to play a role in the response of nitric oxide. Um, so, the question is, so it seems that nitric oxide is involved both at molecular level and a physiological level. The question remains, where are nitric oxide, uh, where, where are the effects of this um, higher amount of nitric oxide? This is a summary of some of the mechanisms affected by nitric oxide at high altitude. On the left, the possible consequences of an exposure to high altitude and on the right, the response in which nitric oxide may uh, play a role. In this uh, review published by uh, Cinzia Bell and his colleagues, uh, the authors summarized some of the effects of nitric oxide primarily on uh, uh, respiratory system. And on the left, we can see the figure showing uh, the effects of inhalation of nitric oxide on pulmonary artery pressure at high altitude. And we can see that uh, the lower pulmonary pressure was related to a positive response in the subject. So subject, for example, that had uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, the uh, subject indicated by APACE and APS, were um, less responses to the inhalation of nitric oxide, as well as subject, uh, for example, with perinatal hypoxia or Indian soldiers who uh, showed symptoms of pulmonary edema. On uh, the right, uh, we uh, see the same study and uh, we see a summary of subject with uh, uh, pulmonary edema resistance or pulmonary edema susceptible who, who were able to stay well during altitude exposure who, or who manifested some symptoms of this pulmonary edema. And we can see that uh, resistance subject or subject uh, were characterized by um, higher value of nitric oxide metabolites, whereas subjects susceptible of pulmonary edema show a lower level of nitric oxide. And it, it is interesting to uh, 
see that uh, there were no differences between subjects who had symptoms and subjects who did not. Uh, following these uh, evidences, uh, some researchers investigated the effects of dietary nitrate supplementation, so a type of intervention which is aimed to increase the amount of nitric oxide, usually as in form of beetroot juice, uh, on acute mountain sickness uh, symptoms and physiological responses to high altitude. They recruited a group of young male trekkers to Mount Everest, about uh, 40 subjects, uh, and uh, they supplemented uh, part of this subject uh, with uh, beetroot juice, and the rest part of the group uh, served as control. And as we can see, unfortunately, there was no differences between these two groups. So dietary nitrate supplementation is not uh, um, beneficial to adaptation, at least in subject young and healthy. For uh, what concerns the effect of nitric oxide and the relationship of nitric oxide and hypoxia at cardiovascular level, in this study, a group of researchers, Kaze and co-workers, tested the hypothesis that nitric oxide is involved in the increase of skeletal muscle vasodilation during hypoxic exercise. They recruited 12 subjects and uh, they asked to perform moderate intensity exercise with a forearm during normoxia or hypoxia condition, one with saline infusion, so control condition, and one with an inhibitor of nitric oxide production. What they uh, so in their study was that uh, the uh, hypoxia as well as the exercise intensity obviously increased the uh, forearm blood flow and the vascular conductance. However, the change in forearm blood flow and vascular conductance from normoxic to hypoxic condition was substantially lower when nitric oxide inhibitor was administered. So suggesting that nitric oxide is involved in this response. However, the same study, the same research group conducted another study, supplemented subject with dietary nitrates, so increasing nitric oxide bioviability, and tried to uh, understand if uh, there was an increase of the response of this forearm blood flow. And interestingly, they didn't found any change in young subject, but they saw a significant increase of vascular conductance in older subject exposed to hypoxia. And this conductance, uh, and this increase in conductance was strongly related to the changes in nitric oxide bioviability. For what concerns exercise capacity and muscle oxidative metabolism, I will uh, I know that Letizia will talk about that, so I don't know, I, I will not <laughs> say anything on that. And uh, to summarize my presentation, we can say that uh, nitric oxide seems to play an important role in at least some of the physiological adaptation related to hypobaric hypoxia. This involves both central and peripheral adaptation like pulmonary, microvascular, and so on. Uh, although there are clear evidences of this importance, study conducted up to date seems to suggest that the increase on nitric oxide bioavailability, at least in subjects where this nitric oxide bioavailability is normal, does not have a positive effect. But further studies of are obviously needed, particularly in subjects where this bioviability may be reduced, for example, uh, aging subjects. I would like to thank all the research group that uh, is working and that work with me during these days and you for the attention. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Simone, for this excellent overview. Uh, of the topic. I'm sure we will be able to discuss a bit more after Letizia's talk, but just before we move on, just a general question. Uh, you have showed some data uh, uh, suggesting that there is no uh, positive effect of uh, dietary nitrate supplementation on uh, acute mountain sickness, etc. 
Is there any evidence uh, to suggest that this might be beneficial for any other high altitude um, illnesses or complications during the adaptation or not? Uh, it's not easy, an easy answer because uh, the problem it seems that there are some evidences that suggest that uh, nitric oxide supplementation, nitric oxide or dietary nitrate supplementation may be effective on uh, some parameters related to pulmonary edema, uh, particularly a reduction of uh, arterial pressure, which is related to pulmonary edema. Uh, the problem is that the studies are very uh, small and uh, there is a lot of variance of the response. So I think that we need further study before be able to give a very strong conclusion on the topic. But there are mixed results. So some are positive and some not. Yes, given the, the evidence uh, or the effects of nitric oxide on, uh, on blood pressure and everything, one would expect that it might be beneficial, especially in terms of the uh, edemas, like pulmonary uh, and stuff. But OK, so more work needs to be done, apparently. Yeah, and there are also evidences, for example, at cerebral uh, vascular uh, conductance, which in some part is related to some negative effects of uh, hypoxia, but uh, uh, we, need, we need more study. We know that it's very difficult to conduct altitude expedition and research experiment, but uh, I think we, we can do something on the topic. Okay, thank you again. And with this great introduction to the topic, I will now hand over the microphone to Letizia to present her, her work in this uh, exciting area. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's good, yeah. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to invite me to speak uh, for this session. Uh, today I'm going to discuss the effects for, of enhanced nitric oxide bioavailability on exercise tolerance at high altitude. Um, I want just to briefly recall what Simone already well explained about the nitric oxide production pathways. In condition of normal oxygen availability, um, nitric oxide is produced from starting from the amino acid arginine in a pathway which is oxidant dependent thanks you to um, thanks to NOS enzymes. Nitric oxide is a very reactive molecule and if not immediately utilized it is uh, oxidized to uh, nitrite and nitrate. In condition of low partial pressure of oxygen, nitrate can be converted to nitrite, and then nitrite can be reduced to nitric oxide. Thanks to this uh, last pathway described, the nitrate, nitrite, and no pathway, it's possible to increase nitric oxide bioavailability through the ingestion of food rich in nitrate, like uh, green leafy vegetables and beetroot. For example, the ingestion of um, beetroot juice, concentrated beetroot juice, lead to the ingestion of a high amount of nitrate that are absorbed at gastrointestinal level and stored inside the salivary glands. Then nitrate can be released in the oral cavity and thanks to the oral bacteria present on the tongue surface, uh, nitrate can be converted to nitrite. Nitrite are then swallowed and absorbed and ga at gastric and um, intestinal level, and thanks to the systemic uh, circulation, um, nitrite can reach the peripheral organ, including the skeletal muscle, in which uh, uh, nitrite can be converted to nitric oxide, in particular in the active muscle, where an acid and epoxic uh, environment is present. In order to understand if uh, dietary nitrate supplementation is able to increase nitric oxide bioavailability, uh, plasma nitrate and nitrite uh, concentration um, are measured. In uh, this graph, you can see the level of plasma nitrate and nitrite after the ingestion of different concentrated beetroot juice. Um, for example, um, ingesting a um, quantity of uh, 4.2 millimole of nitrate leads to a slight increase in plasma nitrate and nitrite. 
the increase of nitric oxide uh, metabolites is greater when they just, with the ingestion of 8.4 millimole of nitrate and is even greater with the, the ingestion of 16.8 millimole of nitrate. Um, this last two dose of supplementation, 8.4 and 16.8 millimole of nitrate, are able to induce ergogenic effects uh, when we talk about uh, acute supplementation. But not only the amount of nitrate ingested is important, but also the um, time between the ingestion and the uh, performance or test. This is because uh, uh, from the ingestion to the peak level of plasma nitrate nitrite, uh, there is a time frame um, lasted at least two hours. If we talk about chronic supplementation that usually lasted a um, few days or several weeks, is it possible to have ergogenic effects also with a lower dose or, of nitrate, like uh, 6 millimole? With concentrated bitter juice is um, utilized a lot in research because it's uh, easy to manage and uh, is also possible to obtain a placebo, which is nitrate depleted, but with the same taste and uh, the same color. Um, it is also important to know that uh, a, an effective nitrate supplementation can be rich um, eating green leafy vegetables in a normal diet. For example, the combination of raw spinach and cooked colored greens uh, can lead to the ingestion of 8 millimole of nitrate. Moreover, um, the kinetic of plasma nitrate and nitrite after the ingestion of the right amount of green leaf, leafy vegetable is very similar uh, to the one one found after uh, the ingestion of concentrated beetroot juice. Uh, once uh, we are able to increase nitric oxide bioavailability through dietary nitrate supplementation, the question is how this augmented nitric oxide bioavailability can affect exercise tolerance. Um, the physiological mechanism underlie to uh, the ergogenic effects of dietary nitrate supplementation are still debated, in particular the ones regarding the mitochondrial efficiency. Uh, however, a general consensus uh, has been reached regarding the increase in skeletal muscle oxygen delivery due to the vasodilatatory effect of nitric oxide and the reduction of ATP cost of contraction. The improvement of this physiological mechanism can lead to an improved exercise performance, generally measured in um, time trial or distance trials, and an increased exercise tolerance identifies as the reduction of oxygen consumption during a constant work rate exercise. The first studies evaluating dietary nitrate supplementation were carried out in Normoxia, um, in this study, we evaluate both the exercise tolerance and the exercise performance. The exercise tolerance was uh, evaluated um, during a moderate constant work rate exercise in terms of oxygen consumption, and the exercise performance was evaluated um, during a three kilometer time trial. Um, we evaluated, we performed this test after uh, um, both supplementation with placebo or nitrate in subject with different fitness level, low, moderate, and high aerobic fitness level. Nitrate supplementation was able to uh, decrease the oxygen consumption during moderate intensity exercise only in subject with moderate and low aerobic fitness level, while no difference were detected in subject with high aerobic fitness level. Similarly, in uh, the three kilometer time trial, the time to complete the distance was decreased in subject with low and moderate fitness level, but no differences were detected in subject with aerobic fitness level. Um, the lack of, um, of uh, ergogenic effects of uh, dietary nestle supplementation in high aerobic fitness um, subject is probably related to the higher level of NOS enzymes 
the higher level of skeletal muscle capillarization, the uh, higher level of calcium angling protein in the skeletal, skeletal muscle, and the lower percentage of type 2 fiber present in this subject. Interestingly, uh, some positive results about dietary supplementation were found in endurance athletes where, when the exercise was performed with the upper body musculature. In fact, in, in fact a decrease in um, time to complete a time trial was detected in uh, highly trained rowers and kayakers, while no difference were found in uh, uh, cyclists and runners. Uh, this is probably related to the fact that has been demonstrated a fiber 2 specific effects of dietary nitrate supplementation. Since the nitrate, nitrite, and no pathway um, is potentiated in condition of uh, hypoxia, um, several studies evaluate the effects of dietary nitrate supplementation in normobaric hypoxia. One example is the studies uh, from Kelly and colleague who evaluate the effect of p supplementation during moderate and severe intensity exercise. In uh, the first graph on your left, you can see uh, the reduction in oxygen consumption after p supplementation compared to placebo during a moderate intensity exercise. And in the graph on your right, you can see the increase in time to exhaustion during a severe intensity exercise after b condition compared to placebo. However, not all these studies carried out in normobaric hypoxia showed positive results after dietary nitrate supplementation. In this table, you can see how after acute supplementation, only um, three studies of seven show positive results. And after chronic supplementation, how only two studies of five show positive results. These uh, mixed results can be due to uh, several factors. For example, the level of uh, altitude simulated, the fitness level of the subjects, and the test performed in order to detect the differences. Few studies were carried out in uh, altitude environment. One of the first for, was the one carried out by by Carriker and colleagues, who evaluated the effects of uh, nitrate supplementation compared to placebo at 3,500 meters during uh, four different cycling bouts at uh, 40, 50, 60, and 70% of uh, view to peak. As you can see, no difference were detected between the two conditions, nitrate supplementation and placebo, and the lack of positive results is probably due to the characteristics of the subject involved in this study since they were um, trained cyclists with a view to peak higher than 60 milliliter per kilogram per minute. Due to the evidences uh, just described and the possible positive effects of dietary nitrate supplementation in hypoxia, we decided to start the Beaton Alps project in order to investigate the effects of dietary nitrate supplementation on exercise tolerance in high altitude. For the studies, we recruited 14 subjects. You can see the anthropometric characteristics in the table. And uh, um, the v peak measure at sea level range from 31 to 64 milliliter per kilogram per minute. Then all the experimental equipments were moved to Casati Hut and 3,300 meter above sea level and a laboratory was set up in order to carry out all the experiment. This study followed a randomized crossover double-blind control trial, as usually utilized in this type of uh, supplementation study. After five days of acclimatization, subject followed two periods of supplementation with Petro juice, 8.4 millimol of nitrate per day, or placebo. Then two periods were interposed by a washout period lasted four days. At the end of the acclimatization period, the subject performed two incremental exercises, one on uh, arm ergometer in order to evaluate the effects on the upper body musculature, and uh, the second one on the cycle ergometer. The data deriving from the te these tests were utilized uh, to set up the intensity of the constant work rate exercises carried out at the end of the supplementation. 
two types of tests were uh, carried out, one at moderate intensity, 80% of gas exchange threshold, and one at severe intensity, 50% of the difference between gas exchange threshold and peak oxygen consumption. Uh, plasma nitrate and nitrite were measured from blood sample taking two and a half hours after the last supplementation by chemiluminescence. As you can see in the graph, uh, both plasma nitrate and nitrite significantly increased after b supplementation compared to placebo. And this is very interesting. In b condition, the level of plasma nitrate and nitrite was very similar to uh, those found in Tibetans as already explained by Simone. Moving to the ergogenic effects of dietarinated supplementation during cycle ergometer exercise in moderate intensity. In the upper panel, you can see a typical example of the oxygen consumption during the test after Betelgeuse supplementation, purple cycle compared to placebo gray cycle. On average, the oxygen consumption was significantly lower after b supplementation compared to placebo at about 4%. Interestingly, um, the decrease in oxygen consumption was higher in subjects with lower fitness level measured at the view to peak reached during the incremental exercise at high altitude. A um, slightly or no difference were found in subjects with uh, higher aerobic fitness level as previously demonstrated in normoxia. Moving to the severe intensity exercise, on the left you can see a typical example of the oxygen consumption during the test after b supplementation, purple cycle compared to placebo, gray cycle. And on the right you can see how the um, time to exhaustion was on average increased uh, at about 70 seconds. Moving to the armor gometer exercise during moderate intensity, uh, we detected a significant decrease um, after b supplementation compared to placebo that was at about 4%. And during severe intensity exercise, a significant increase in time to exhaustion that was at about 120 seconds, even greater to the difference found during cycling. So based on uh, the results uh, obtained in this study, we can conclude that dietarinated supplementation affects the physiological responses to moderate and severe intensity exercises, reducing the oxygen consumption and increasing the time to exhaustion, both in lung and air exercises. In cyclegometer exercise, the trinitary supplementation was less effective in subjects with higher fitness level. I would like to thank the subjects involved in these studies, or the research, the research group involved in this study, and the University of Calgary, where I'm currently conducting my postdoc, and you for your attention. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Letizia, for this. Uh, a great overview of your research, uh, recent work. Uh, we have a, 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 a great question, which I was also thinking about during your talk from Joshua in particular, uh, and it relates to the, to the dose uh, response or the dose of the beetroot supplementation, because uh, on one of your first slides, you showed that the more, the, the higher the dosage, the better the subsequent uh, physiological outcome. And, uh, are there any detrimental effects to increasing the, the dose, especially in regards to the potential gastrointestinal uh, discomfort and, you know, issues related to that? Could you comment on the dosage, the optimal dosage, let's say, uh, of yes. that? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, actually, it's true. With a uh, higher level of nitrate in the beetroot juice, so a higher amount of nitrate ingested, there is a significant increase in plasma nitrate and nitrite. But this, this is not always related to the ergogenic effects. So at some point, uh, even if the plasma nitrate and nitrite increase more, the physiological effects stay stable. For example, in the acute supplementation, the results in time in term to time to exhaustion after, after 8.4 or 16.4 8 uh, millimolar of nitrate ingested were very similar. 
So you would then think that it's somewhere uh, in it, that, that it might be even lower than the 8.2 uh, millimoles or not. Um, for the acute supplementation, no, because lower doses like 4.2 millimole of nitrate were not able to elicit any ergogenic uh, benefit. Uh, but for uh, chronic supplementation, it's possible to utilize lower dose of, uh, plasma, of uh, nitrate supplementation, sorry, in order to have physiological benefits, for example, 6 millimole. But also in um, chronic supplementation, lower doses like uh, three millimole are not able to elicit any ergogenic benefits. Okay. So, but when you, uh, if you use the correct dose, uh, is it is it dependent on the individual, or you can just say, okay, it's eight point two, and that works for everybody, or because we know that, for example, hypoxia is really an an environmental stimuli that. Uh, provokes highly in, uh, inter-individual different responses in terms of, you know, physiological consequences. Is that the same with the beetroot supplementation or is it one size fits all? No, no, it's the same with the beetroot supplementation. Uh, sometimes even we doses that normally elicite ergogenic effects, we don't have any results. For example, with, with the highly trained subject. So is a uh, very different between individuals. Okay, and uh, this leads us to the next question. Most of your data, I would uh, dare to suggest that indicates that uh, the best effects you can see in submaximal exercise compared to, to higher exercise uh, uh, levels. Uh, maybe Simone can also comment on that, but, uh, and this is good in a way because most of the uh, mountaineering activities anyway relatively long term low i mean middle uh, intensity level so that can be a, a from an applied point of view a good thing in a way yeah yeah exactly you can have a uh, effect on both uh, so moderate intensity or severe intensity exercise in um, of moderate intensity, what is increased is the exercise tolerance, since uh, um, the oxygen consumption is lower, so it's possible to carry out the exercise easily compared to the placebo condition. And in terms to severe intensity exercise, um, you can carry out the exercise for more time. Okay, and uh, the last question from my side, uh, uh, relates to uh, the uh, the blinding of the participants. Is it difficult to blind individuals to, to beetroot supplementation? I've never worked on that, but uh, I heard that uh, the, the taste is quite specific and quite intense. So how do you manage to do that and what type of a placebo do you use? Um, utilizing beetroot juice supplementation is possible to have a beetroot juice which is depleted from nitrate but with the same color and the same taste so it's indistinguishable so the same you can try to guess but uh, our participant never get it right so it's very hard to say which one is uh, with nitrate and uh, which one is not um, if you want to carry out an um, experiment with uh, and with a specific diet, implementing the green leafy vegetables. Um, if the participant know the specific uh, of the research, so know that uh, the green leafy vegetables contain high level of nitrate, it's been harder to um, keep, it, keep them blind. Yeah, okay. So it's good to hear that it's relatively easy to, to blind them with the, the correct supplements. But I agree that probably it's uh, really important to kind of standardize the diet or the intake of, of the, um, the nitrate via the dietary, other normal diet, diet intakes, yeah? Yeah, uh, so exactly. are there, Yeah, sorry. Uh, so are there any other uh, questions from uh, Stephen or Chris or any other uh, speaker? Yeah? Simona, you want to comment anything on, on this second part of the beetroot? No, I, th I think that uh, Letizia explained very, very well the topic. Uh, I totally agree. There is a lot of uh, data in literature that shows there is a different response among the subjects. Uh, we know that some of the effects are related to the dose. 
it's administered to the fitness level of the subject, but there are also other factors that uh, actually we don't really know. And so we need to, we need other study to better explain the, the effects. Uh, regarding the supplementation, uh, sometimes in some studies, uh, uh, you can uh, try to avoid uh, to give the specific uh, uh, indication to the subject, particularly when you use diets, uh, you can, uh, comp you can t say to the subject that uh, you are going to test the effects of two different diets uh, without uh, expressing the clear effects uh, on, uh, for example, the exercise tolerance and so on. And uh, this can obviously help because the, the aim should be to try to avoid uh, commercial products and try to move to diets, traditional diets. There are a lot of control trials randomized in, in, clini in uh, clinical studies where they use uh, uh, the diet. It's called uh, uh, low, it's usually used to uh, counteract the higher pressure uh, values in subjects and so I think it's uh, it's possible and we need uh, further studies. If, if I can add something is uh, the diet that uh, Simone was telling about is the DASH diet, DASH or DASH diet and uh, it's very useful in uh, subjects that show hypertension because uh, of the vasodilatatory effects of nitric oxide which is able to reduce the blood pressure Okay, so then uh, we have uh, two more questions from the audience. Uh, if we, uh, I think we have time for both of them. So uh, uh, any thoughts on the ergogenic uh, potential of uh, nitrate supplementation at lower levels of hypobaric hypoxia? So that means uh, the levels uh, usually targeted by like athletes training at the altitude. So that uh, around like 1,200 to 2,500 meters. Uh, like in general altitude training camps, would that uh, you find it uh, useful or um, worthwhile? Uh, the, go, go, lady. Okay, the problem with the supplementation in uh, athletes is that uh, seems not to be, to be very effective um, without considering the level of altitude. If we uh, talk about runners or cyclists, um, if the supplementation is at sea level of at uh, 200, 2,500 meters or more, the supplementation seems not to be effective. Um, so okay. the, prob this, the problem uh, with the athlete is the effectiveness of the supplementation itself. Okay. Yes, and if I can add, I, I saw on the chat that the question was coming from Stephen Bailey, which an expert of this of this topic yeah. and I, I think that uh, one one open question is uh, uh, if these effects are also um, targeted on muscle function because we have been uh, focused on the um, muscle oxidative metabolism but we know that recently some researchers have shown effects also on muscle power and muscle force so maybe also in relation to the uh, topic uh, discussed by Louise, that the combination of hypoxia and nitrate uh, with lower altitude may have effects on uh, fatigue resistance or something related to that, which can be obviously important for uh, elite athletes or well-trained athletes. And if I can add a little thing, uh, also um, should be important to evaluate the effects of the supplementation in the athlete in combination with the training. So um, supplement the athletes just before, two hours before the training session, and see if the uh, supplementation can add the training session and then uh, if at the end it's possible to have uh, higher benefits. Okay. Thank you very much. Next one is relatively short from Ben Stacy. He's uh, wondering if it would be also worthwhile to assess uh, S nitrose hemoglobin in the plasma or red blood cells when you measure the effects of, uh, in addition to nitrate and nitrate, uh, when you measure the effects of dietary um, uh, NO supplementation. Uh, 
Yes, absolutely. Yes, we, we usually measure nitrate and nitrate, which are metabolites of nitric oxide and seems to be related to nitric oxide by viability, but there are a lot of other compounds, uh, particularly the one related uh, to the binding of nitric oxide to the hemoglobin or to the nitrosylation of other compounds, which surely have some uh, effects also directly independent from nitric oxide. So obviously, yes, uh, the problem is that some of these measurements are difficult. Sometimes we cannot take some, a lot of bloods, particularly during expedition and so on. But yes, because nitric oxide is substantially a radical, so it can have a lot of things. We have seen that sometimes it has effects, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So we need to have a clearer picture by measuring these compounds. Okay, great. And now with the final question from uh, Josh Elliott. <clears throat> He's wondering, based on your uh, work uh, and research on the topic, have you maybe identified any physiological markers uh, that may, uh, uh, sorry, I just lost it now, any physiological markers that might help you to determine the optimal dosage of dietary ni nitrate needed for each individual, you know, the correlation between the, the dose and the response of certain physiological parameters or which one would be optimal to monitor, let's say. Um, one thing that can be monitored is the gain of nitrate and nitrite in the plasma after the supplementation. Because for example, in athlete, in endurance elite athlete, their level of plasma nitrate and nitrite is already higher in normal condition. And with the supplementation, the values increase, but the delta in increase is not so big as in um, normal subjects. Um, this is, but this is not always related to the ergogenic effects because even if the increase is uh, the same in two different populations, sometimes the effects is not uh, the table in terms to ergogenic response. Um, something that is uh, coming up uh, recently is the uh, level of um, nitrate and nitrite in the muscles. But actually, I'm not sure if it's something that uh, can be used to um, determine the optimum dosage of dietary nitrate. Okay. Well, thank you very much. With this, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. I will just uh, remind you again uh, uh, regarding our uh, session next week. So it will be at a different time, uh, time zone, uh, 900 British Standard Time, about pre-cooling in the heat. Uh, I would also like to thank again Luis, Simone, and Letizia for their excellent talks and both of the uh, panelists for their help and would wish you a pleasant um, morning, afternoon, Thursday, and have a lovely, <coughs> lovely weekend, and hope to see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.